The 2020 Google Capture the Flag competition didn't include a beginner's quest. Instead, a self-reported easy challenge was earmarked in each of the hardware, crypto, porn, reversing, web, and sandbox categories. While I don't necessarily agree on Google's definition of easy in most of these categories, today we are going to talk about the highest solved challenge, so arguably the easiest, aptly named beginner challenge from the reversing category. As we can see on CTF time, there are a number of write-ups already released for this challenge, and the write-ups typically fall within one of three solution categories. Firstly, there are solutions which make use of anger. You can take a look at John Hammond's video for how to solve the problem this way. Secondly, there are solutions which make use of Z3. You can take a look at Ginvel's video for how to solve the problem this way. And lastly, there are solutions which don't use a SAT solver at all which is the approach I took during the competition and the approach we will take during this video. So let's get started by downloading the beginner challenge and reading the description. Dust off the cobwebs, let's reverse. After downloading and extracting the archive, we receive what appears to be a binary, a.out, and we can use the file command to see that it is indeed a 64-bit executable. Let's mark the binary as executable and YOLO it on our host system to see what happens. Okay, so the program is asking for a flag as an input then telling us we are a failure. Good start to a Saturday morning. Let's take a look in Binary Ninja and see what we are dealing with here. Luckily for us, the binary isn't stripped and the main function is fairly self-contained for the entire challenge. We can clearly see the success and failure branches. So let's figure out what we need to do to reach that success block and claim our flag. Firstly, we can see that the program prompts us for a flag, which we also saw during our dynamic execution. Next, the program reads 15 bytes of data via scanf and places that data into an XMM register. If, like me, you're not familiar with this register, a quick Google search can solve our problems. Streaming SIMD extensions is a single instruction, multiple data instruction set extension to the x86 architecture. SIMD instructions can greatly increase performance when exactly the same operations are to be performed on multiple data objects. Okay, so that's sort of helpful, but I work better with examples, so let's keep scrolling. The following simple example demonstrates the advantage of using SSE. Consider an operation like vector addition, which is used very often in computer graphics applications. To add two single precision four component vectors together using x86 requires four floating point addition instructions. And here in Wikipedia, we can see an example of the higher level instructions which would be required to add these vectors as per the text. This corresponds to four x86 fad instructions in the object code. On the other hand, as the following pseudocode shows, a single 128-bit packed add instruction can replace the four scalar addition operations. Okay, for me, that's an easier to understand explanation. Put another way, the SIMD instructions allow the CPU to group a bunch of duplicate instructions together and then execute them at the same time as a single instruction. We also know that the register size is 128 bits, and since we know scanf is only reading 15 bytes, we've also probably recovered a first character. Somewhere, there is a null byte. Since this is a C program and the flag is in a readable format, let's make an assumption that the last byte is probably a null byte. Looking back in Binary Ninja, we can see that next we have three operations performing some of these SIMD instructions on our data. pshuf b, pAd, and pxor. Rather than getting ahead of ourselves and guessing, let's take a look at some documentation as to what these instructions are, starting with pshuffb. pshuffb performs in-place shuffles of bytes in the destination operand according to the shuffle control mask in the source operand. Each byte in the shuffle control mask forms an index to permute the corresponding byte in the destination operand. Next, the pad instruction. The pAd and vpAd instructions add packed double word integers from the first source operand and second source operand and store the packed integer results in the destination operand. When an individual result is too large to be represented in 32 bits, the result is wrapped around and the low 32 bits are written to the destination operand. That is, the carry is ignored. And lastly, the pxor instruction performs a bitwise logical exclusive OR operation on the source operand and the destination operand and stores the result in the destination operand. Jumping back into Binary Ninja again and understanding these instructions, we can now track what happens to our input more clearly. First, some shuffle is performed, then an addition, then an XOR. Once our data has been mutated, a string compare is then performed comparing 16 bytes. 
This check is verifying that the data we entered matches the data output after the mutations. So our next clue, our input needs to be the flag, which after the shuffle, add and XOR instructions also needs to equal itself. Next, another string compare is called, comparing the first four bytes on an expected prefix. If we follow to the expected prefix location in Binary Ninja, we can see four more bytes of the flag are revealed to us. CTF opening bracket. Only 11 more characters to go. Let's throw in another assumption, that the flag also ends in a closing bracket. So now we are down to 10 unknown characters. So how can we get these last 10 characters and solve this challenge without an SAT solver? Due to the overflow from the addition and the subsequent XOR, it's a bit tricky to go backwards and work back up from the constants to the flag. Given the key space and limited time for the CTF, a raw brute force is probably not an intended solution either. However, we do already know a few important things. We know the length of the solution. We know that the input needs to match the output, and we also know six bytes of the flag. CTF open bracket, close bracket, and the trailing null byte. So how can we use this information to solve the challenge? Let's take a deeper look at the shuffle pattern and see if we can figure out how to cheat our way to the flag. If we follow the pattern location in Binary Ninja, we can see how data is to be shuffled. While we know how this works from the documentation, let's jump straight in with an example and solidify that understanding. Let's start the binary in GDB, disassemble main, set a breakpoint before the shuffle instruction is executed, start the binary and enter a flag so we can compare the input before and after the shuffle operation is performed. Let's enter CTF open bracket 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, closing bracket, and then take a look at the value in the XMM register before the shuffle operation is performed. As we can see, our hex encoded data is stored in the register as expected. We can then continue execution to the next instruction, and after the shuffle, take another look at the register. As we can see, and as we expected, the shuffle mapping has been applied to our data. While we're at it, let's just perform the add instruction and lastly, the XOR instruction as well to see what happens to our input. To make things easier, let's also hex decode the result and analyze what we ended up with. From our analysis on the binary and with some assumptions, we already know six bytes, the first four and the last two. From the output, we can see that some of our assumptions, and therefore original characters, must have been correct. The C, opening bracket, and null bytes from the input are also in the correct place in the output, which as we know is also a requirement for the flag to be correct. But if six bytes of our input were correct, that means that six bytes of our output also have to be correct. But which six? Let's take another look at that shuffle mapping. With our known input of CTF open bracket 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, closing bracket, and before any other permutations, our shuffle is transformed to the following sequence. This makes sense from the shuffle mapping we already saw. Index 0 is mapped to index 15, index 1 is mapped to index 3, index 2 is mapped to index 0, and so on for the entire input. As we just discussed, since we already knew valid characters of the input, in our first run, we actually spat out more than just three correct bytes. We actually spat out six, but only three were easily recognizable. Based on the mapping, we actually recovered additional bytes at other output indexes. They just weren't as easily recognizable. Specifically, due to our known correct input, we actually identified the correct bytes for indexes 15, 3, 0, 8, 7, and 9. So what were these bytes? The output data after the shuffle, add, and XOR instructions was as follows. So taking the known correct inputs and indexes, we have now recovered nine bytes of our flag in the output. Since the output also needs to map to the input, that means we have also recovered nine total bytes of our input too. So what do these newly mapped known correct input bytes map to? Let's take another look at our shuffle mapping and step through it again. Index seven is mapped to index two, index eight is mapped to index 11, and index 9 is mapped to index 6. So let's run the application again with our known correct input and recover these additional bytes from the output thanks to the shuffle mapping doing the hard work for us. We can rerun the binary in GDB, input our known but incomplete flag, execute the shuffle, add and XOR instructions, and then take another look at the data in the XMM register. Let's also hex decode it again so it's easier to verify visually. Ignoring the overflow issue here, which will sort itself out in just a moment, 
we have just managed to recover some more bytes. Let's follow the same iterative process and continue recovering new flag bytes with each additional execution. Index 11 maps to index 5, so let's throw that at the binary 2 and recover another byte. Index 5 maps to index 4, index 4 maps to index 10, index 10 maps to index 12, index 12 maps to index 13, finally, index 13 maps to index 14. But we already know what that will result in, so let's just test our flag. We can quit GDB and run the application. At the prompt, we can enter the flag we have just recovered. Bingo, challenge solved. We have recovered the sim for me flag, just by letting the binary run a few times and then analyzing the output. Somebody who could be bothered to learn GDB scripting could also have probably solved this even more efficiently. So just to recap, what have we done here exactly? We have basically used our known good input bytes to ignore the operations performed by the binary and instead focus on recovering each known good output byte based on the shuffle index mapping. Since we know the input must match the output, and due to the way the shuffle is mapped, we can iteratively recover additional input bytes based on the output from known good inputs. Instead of brute forcing or being smart or using math, we just need to execute the program and allow the challenge to solve itself for us. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. It really helps the channel grow if you comment, like, and subscribe below. Also, if you're interested in solving capture the flag challenges across a range of traditional Jeopardy-based categories, make sure to check out 247ctf.com.